All right, so certain chemical formulas, chemicals, are made as hydrates. Hydrates simply means that you have a chemical formula, a chemical a compound of some sort. It has a chemical formula. But when it was made, um, this chemical uh, pulls water, has an affinity for water. All right, We call this hydroscopic. Something is hydroscopic means that it pulls water out of the air. Now, I don't know if you guys have ever bought shoes or bought some sort of canned food like beans or something like that. And inside the package of shoes or in the canned food container is a little packet that says silicon oxide or some other kind of uh, desiccant. That's another word for a chemical that absorbs water out of the air. All right. And uh, the point is, right, I mean, without water, it's hard for bacteria to grow. No bacteria, no smell. So, you know, shoes won't smell bad if there's no water around for the bacteria to grow in them. Uh, food can't rot if there's no bacteria to grow, and the bacteria can't grow if there's, if there's low moisture, right? So low moisture, right, uh, can be achieved by using things like desiccants. Um, uh, and certain chemicals have an affinity for water. Hydrates are chemicals <coughs> that have this affinity for water, and in their chemical formula itself, we actually include the ratio or the amount of water per unit of the chemical. And the reason you do this is because if you don't, for example, if you don't do this, if, if, if I go to the stock room and say, hey, I need some, so this chemical right here, what's this chemical? Well, we can uh, bring up our, um, let me push, so we can look at this chemical and try to name it. What would this chemical's name be? Well, we can bring up our, uh, periodic table, Cu, maybe you already know, that's copper, right here it is, copper, um, and uh, SO4, we can bring up our polyatomic ion, and look for the SO4 2 minus ion, that's sulfate. So this is copper sulfate, and if we look at the ratio, the charge on the ion, charge on the copper ion, if we have one sulfate ion that has a 2 minus, the copper must have a 2 plus charge on it. So this is copper 2 sulfate. So we have our copper 2 sulfate here. And for every unit of the copper sulfate that we have, we have this dot and shows us that we have five water molecules. Okay. Now, why would you do that? Well, if we wanted to go to the stock room and just get a bottle of, of simply copper sulfate, right? We don't want any of the hydrate on it. All right. Well, here's my bottle of copper sulfate. The problem is, it's hydroscopic. It absorbs water out of the air. So every time I open the lid, water comes in and starts sticking to the surface there, right? To the copper sulfate crystals that are on the surface. And over time, those copper sulfate crystals become more than just copper sulfate. They absorb more and more water. And so the next person or the 10th person or, you know, many people later weigh out a little bit of this copper sulfate into a weigh boat and they have some mass and they think that that mass corresponds to the copper sulfate but it doesn't right it doesn't because if it says 1.00 grams here and that's how much copper sulfate we're expecting to have some of that mass is from the water that's sticking to it all right so if you just go and get the anhydrous and that means without water the anhydrous uh, um, version or anhydrous form of the chemical right and you can do that then you run the risk of every time it being open changing how much is necessary to weigh out to get a whole unit of copper sulfate so uh, what they do is they allow the copper sulfate to interact with the humidity and collect as much water as it needs and so it will stabilize and will not increase the amount of water over time and so they call those hydrates so this chemical here copper sulfate is a hydrate right here I mean the way we have it drawn here and five is how many hydrates there are five is is uh, the prefix for five is penta like pentagon so this is copper sulfate pentahydrate okay and you can count the number of oxygen atoms in this whole unit there's four that are from this copper sulfate but then there's five from these five waters all right so that's how you name copper or that's how you name hydrates and you can count up the number of whatever atom of interest that uh, you're trying to identify how many elements there are of, right? All right. So now how do we differentiate? Uh, what are some ways that we can, some, some vocabulary we can use to kind of differentiate different types of matter? All right. 
Matter can be separated into what we call pure substances or mixtures. Now, a pure substance is where everything in the container or everything in the, your little sample that you have, right? So maybe here's a, a pile of some stuff and it's on my dish. Everything I have there, if it's all the same stuff, then that's going to be called a pure substance. Now, it doesn't need to be all the same element. If it was all the same element, that would be definitely a pure substance. So I know if it was all gold, if it's just a big pile of gold and it's all gold, that'd be a pure substance. Everything there's the same. But it could also be all, for example, sodium chloride, right? It doesn't need to be the same atom. It just, you need to know that the ratio of atoms is the same throughout this whole pile of material, okay? It could also be maybe a, a pile of this chemical, c 6 h Six. Oops, A16. All right. For example. Oh, no, that can't be. Sorry. Six times two, 14. Two times two is 12, 14. C6, H14. Well, let's just start over here. C6. Uh, one more time. C6, H14. All right. So if I have this, a pile of this chemical, C6, H14, uh, you know, if it's just there, it doesn't have just one kind of thing. It can have carbon and hydrogen. Maybe this is C6H14O2 or something like that, right? It can have um, a variety of different uh, elements in it and still be considered a pure substance if all of the material in there, so now, now what kind of a compound could this be? Maybe it's carbon, let's see, draw it over here. Carbon, 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 four, five, six, <coughs> OH, OH. All right, so this could be our... example of our co compound here all right now this is a complex compound you don't need to understand what it is but the point is all of the small units of whatever there are in here are organized in this exact same way so that could be a pure substance all right so a pure substance can either be compounds or elements now some examples like I talked about gold that's elemental a powder of material that where everything in it is exactly the same. Here's a chemical called octane. Octane is an important chemical in our uh, automotive fuel, C8H18, right? Um, this, these can all be pure substances. They don't have to have just one kind of element to be pure substances, right? Now, mixtures. Mixtures come in lots of different kinds, right? You can have mixtures of any two different kinds of compounds, and then it's a mixture, right? Air is an example of a mixture. In air, what do we have? What's the most abundant gas in air that we have? All right. Uh, the most abundant gas is nitrogen. Nitrogen, there's about 80% nitrogen that we have in the air. All right. Uh, that's nitrogen gas like that. Oxygen gas is about 19%. Uh, and then we have argon gas and carbon dioxide, which are uh, just small fractions of a percent. So um, this is an example of a, a mixture, right? Multiple different kinds of elements, but in different concentrations, and they're not part of the same thing, right? Uh, salad dressing. Salad dressing is another example of a material and, you know, something that we're very familiar with that is a mixture. I mean, this specific kind uh, um, water and vinegar, sorry, oil and vinegar salad dressing, oil and vinegar salad dressing. Um, and I don't know if you guys have ever seen oil and water together, but that's uh, a mixture as well. Um, so some mixtures separate out and they don't combine very well. Some mixtures combine very, very, very well, right? All the air in a classroom or in, in your lab, all of it has essentially the same ratio of nitrogen, oxygen, argon, and carbon dioxide. Now it's true if you go up to the top of the mountains, concentration of oxygen differs, right? But in general, people would say air in a given facility or in a given location is a homogeneous mixture. Now, what does homogeneous mean? Homogeneous doesn't mean the same atoms. It means the same concentrations of the different components in the mixture in different locations. So again, it's the same concentrations of the different components. It's a mixture already. That's why you're, you have to use the word homogeneous or heterogeneous when you're talking about a mixture. So it's definitely a mixture, and they're the same, but if it's homogeneous, it's the same concentration throughout. All right, so here's an example. 
if I have a, a box, right? And inside here I have air, right? Let's say this is 0.5% uh, and 0.5%, okay? Um, if I look at the concentrations of nitrogen, oxygen, argon, and carbon dioxide at this point, and I find that this is their relative concentrations, and then I look over here at this point, and I see also, yes, the same relative concentrations. And then I take a different spot in the box, and I find that, yep, those are the concentrations. That means this container contains a mixture of homogeneous, a homogeneous mixture of nitrogen, oxygen, argon, and carbon dioxide. Anywhere you look, you have the same concentrations. All right. Now, a scenario like this one, where I have, um, this is another example of a, of a homogeneous mixture. Here I have some water, and maybe I dissolve in the water some salt, sodium chloride. All right? We've all done this before. We've seen water dissolve or dissolving salt. As the salt dissolves, it disappears, right? It's all spread out amongst the water. And if you mix it well, the concentration of sodium chloride at the top here will be the same as it will down here. Now if it's not dissolved, if it's not dissolved, then, if for example you take a, a sample of water and then you put something like sand at the bottom, all right? So sand, a good example of sand can be something like silicon oxide, right? Sand won't dissolve in water, right? And so this is a mixture, but it's not a homogeneous one because the concentration of sand, silicon oxide, up here is significantly different than it is down there, right? Or this spot, or that spot, right? Because the concentrations of the elements or the components, the compounds, water or silicon oxide in this scenario, differ from location to location, then we call it a, a heterogeneous mixture. So this is an example of a homogeneous mixture. H O M O homogeneous and this is an example of a heterogeneous mixture. All right. So um some things are might consider homogeneous or might consider heterogeneous depending on your perspective. All right. Uh, milk is one of those things. Now, if you look on the side of the milk, it says homogenized. Homogenized. Well, you know, generally, if something's homogenized and all the components are dissolved, then the liquid will be transparent, or you can see through it, like soda pop. Soda pop or syrup, both of these are examples of homogenized solution. Solutions where they're homogenous mixtures, all the, all the components, all the compounds in the soda pop are all dissolved and evenly distributed. You don't drink the top part of the soda pop and then the bottom part tastes different. Now, if you put ice in, then the top is less concentrated, right? And ice is a physical solid floating in liquid. So you, you're definitely going to have a different scenario in that uh, situation. But if it's just the soda pop itself, all the compounds are going to be equally dissolved and distributed. So that's a homogeneous mixture. Same with syrup. But in milk, you can't see through it. You now it says homogeneous on the side, so you might think, oh, this is a homogeneous mixture. Milk is, uh, you know, and that's what we're talking about, different perspectives. If you think of it from a, well, it's homogeneous compared to how it comes out of the cow, right? Because the way it comes out of the cow is you get a bucket, right? A poorly drawn bucket. Let's try that again. So you get a bucket of milk, right? And I don't know if you guys have ever milked a cow or seen a bucket of milk that's come straight from the cow, but it's very watery. This little area right here is essentially very thin, but you get a lot of cream, foamy, fluffy cream at the top. And this is considered you know, non -homo un unhomogenized milk. And that's how they used to deliver milk to people. And if you wanted it, you know, they put it on your doorstep in the morning, and if you wanted it homogenized, you'd have to shake it up really good before you used it. Kind of like salad dressings used to be, right? Salad dressings, used to be, I mean, we still have heterogeneous salad dressings, but it's significantly less heterogeneous than it used to be. And we're using different kinds of chemicals, uh, which are not dangerous, you know, 
it's not bad to put you know chemicals means anything right so the kinds of chemicals you put into um, salad dressings to make them more homogenous um, are not you know just foodstuffs will uh, they allow the mixture the layers the oil and the water to mix better and to stay mixed longer the same way physical methods have been used to get the cream layer of milk to stay dissolved or stay mixed and you know it's not won't stay mixed forever if you take a sample of milk and leave it out on the counter it'll separate again and you'll get the cream at the top and water at the bottom and so what we say is we suspend suspend the two components together momentarily or you know it depends on your perspective momentarily as well because milk can stay in the fridge for uh, you know a week or two weeks before it actually will begin to separate out if you leave it out on the counter the rea and the separation will become faster because of the the temperature but uh, we call this a suspension a suspension so milk is an example of a suspension all the cream is suspended in the water in the homogenized milk right so homogenized is just a term it's not a, I mean it is a chemical term but in this case milk isn't really a homogenous solution what it is is a suspension all right so we can visualize atoms with these little spheres like this right and that's a reasonable way to kind of think about an atom as a sphere now we know that it has a proton and it has an electron and our little model that we draw for example if i'm going to draw a model of a, a helium atom helium i could look it up here on my periodic table whoops other side two protons that's the two here four that means total of four nucleons meaning two of protons and two of neutrons all right so i'm going to draw it now two protons two neutrons i'll give them little ends all right and then here's my electrons that are going around the outside something like that now you know this is just a model that works for us but this thing isn't holding is it isn't holding still and these aren't in orbits like that they're moving in three dimensions so if this thing if you were to see this thing it wouldn't be just like that it would be kind of a a, a spherical type of a, a a region where electron density is moving all around in that region all right so spheres are fine ways to kind of visualize atoms and we have all these different colors associated with the different atoms and you don't have to memorize these colors you'll catch on to the degree that you need to gradually but um, different colors mean different atoms okay so let's see if we can identify these as either pure substance element compound molecule homogeneous or heterogeneous or homogeneous mixtures all right so you take a second right now push pause try to answer these questions before we go through them okay you want to give your best effort and think about what these things mean all right hot cocoa if you haven't pushed pause, push pause now and do it. Okay, so hot cocoa. Is that a pure substance? Well, one good way or, you know, way to quickly identify pure substances is the periodic table. So we'll get up the periodic table here. No cocoa on the periodic table, so it's not going to necessarily be a uh, pure substance in terms of its elemental form. Now, what about its, um, uh, is, is everything in the cocoa, the hot cocoa, one thing? one kind of molecule one configuration of atoms well no because we don't just have sugar I and mean, we don't just have whatever you know cocoa is not a, a chemical cocoa is has salt it has sugar it has milk it has fats it has all sorts of different flavorings right chemicals vanilla for example so this is not going to be an example of a pure substance definitely not an element and not even a compound right uh, or a molecule uh, what about a heterogeneous mixture um, well heterogeneous or homogeneous is are our last choices right if if it was well mixed and nothing was really dissolving you could think of it as a homogeneous mixture if it's just um, you know that's fine if you're thinking of it as a chemi chemist's perspective, you might say, eh, this is a, a suspension because you can't see through it. 
but um, I don't think that I think we're going to be able to say safely here that it's a um, oh they said heterogeneous mixture heterogeneous mixture so that's a complete perspective from a chemist which is fine fine heterogeneous mixture and that's what milk would really be it's a suspension of a heterogeneous mixture all right ice what about ice ice is just water basically right so pure substance um it's it's more than one element it's oxygen and hydrogen so it's not an element but it can be a pure substance and it is a pure substance is it a compound a compound is you know anything that has a chemical formula is a compound molecule now molecules are compounds that are made up of only nonmetals. now we have our little uh, diagram here to help us remind us of the um, relationship between compounds molecules all right all right so in this circle here we have compounds this is all the different compounds that exist some of those compounds are molecules molecules are all chemicals that are made up of only nonmetals and no ions all right so water has oxygen and hydrogen those are all nonmetals all right so water is a pure substance a compound and a molecule all right white flour how about white flour what's in flour well there's lots of things right it's wheat ground up wheat is an organism you got DNA you got proteins you got sugars you got starches you got all sorts of things right so it's definitely not a pure substance all of those things that I listed are under the group of compounds right again we can remind ourselves here are our compounds we have within our compounds molecular compounds and ionic compounds right and uh, I mean so all those different ones that I was naming there's salts and sugars inside wheat white flour so definitely not a pure substance definitely not an element um, it's not really a compound either right and it's definitely not a compound it's got lots of compounds in it so it doesn't matter if it's molecular it's a mixture of some sort is it a heterogeneous mixture or a homogeneous mixture now again this will depend on perspective um, if you sift it up well and you're looking at a cooking level you would consider it a homogeneous mixture and so you know that's that's good enough right you could also think of ho uh, hot cocoa as a homogeneous mixture that way as well though so all right oops sorry about that we got it sodium chloride sodium chloride pure substance right it's an ionic compound and um, that's it it's not a uh, molecular compound so it doesn't qualify as a molecule all right as excellent so now understanding um, chemical and physical reactions helps us kind of think about physical properties versus chemical properties chemical properties if I have a chemical reaction here a B going to a and then B right we're changing the connectivity between the atoms that's how we know that this is a, a chemical reaction right physical reaction would be something like a B solid going to maybe a B liquid right so this is a physical reaction chemical reactions chemical properties always have to do with reactivity or changing how the elements interact or change their interaction with other elements all right so these are all physical properties don't have to do with that um, and uh, a lot of them have to do with changing states or phases right melting boiling vapor pressure color okay uh, chemical properties a lot of these have to do with or start with reacts with or reactivity toward or something like that right um, and the word oxidizing and reducing are a specific kind of um, reaction that we'll uh, talk about in later chapters but um, phys chemical properties are almost always having to do and corrosion another example of a word that indicates reaction or reactivity all right so magnesium metal is gray is that chemical or physical that's a physical property all right magnesium metal tarnishes in the air tarnishes is fancy word for interacts with oxygen so that's a chemical property here's silver magnesium here it is when it's been oxidized by the air it turns kind of a blackish color the melting point that is a physical property right violently reacts with hydrochloric acid the reacts gives it away right that's a chemical property 
Very good. So which one of the following is a chemical property? Water is colorless. Water reacts violently with uh, sol solid sodium. Water boils at this temperature. Are these all chemical properties or are these all physical properties? Maybe none of these are chemical properties. Take a second, push pause if you need to. All right, so the answer is, push pause if you need to, the answer is uh, reacts violently with sodium chloride, right? Because that is, um, uh, let's see, that is a, uh, yeah, that's a chemical property, right? All right, so we're going to watch this little video here of this piece of sodium being dropped into this puddle of water. All right. Oh, okay. So that was a piece of sodium being dropped into water. Reacts violently with water, and that is our uh, physical property. Or chemical property, sorry. All right, so physical properties, um, as we, as I mentioned, here's an example of a physical property, liquid to solid, right? And uh, liquid state, the water molecules are moving around. Temperature is all that changes when you go from liquid to solid. In solid state, we have a degree of movement, but it's significantly decreased. All right, so um, you should or may or be aware of the um, different states of matter, solid, liquid, gas. All right, so let's watch this movie. Matter can be found in any of four states, solid, liquid, gas, or plasma. Solid can be changed to liquid by melting. Solids can change directly to gas in a process called sublimation. Liquid is changed to gas by boiling. Gas can condense to liquid. Solids can be formed directly from gas by crystallization. A plasma is a group of positive ions and unbound electrons. Plasmas can be produced by energizing gases to give up electrons, as in this neon sign and fluorescent tube. The sun is also a plasma. Over 99% of the matter found in the universe is in the plasma state. All right, excellent. Now, uh, here's an example of a chemical reaction. Chemical reaction here, we're dropping something like HCl into water, and it divides the hydrogen and the chlorine from each other. The chlorine goes off with a negative charge. The hydrogen interacts with the water to form this H3O with a positive charge. All right, so essentially HCl is going in, the atoms are separating from each other and interacting with the water in a different way. Okay, so let's watch this video here. Sodium chloride crystals are held together by attractive forces between the positively charged sodium and negatively charged chloride ion. Whoops. Oh, I wanted to push pause. So we have talked about this before. We've talked about sodium. how the uh, s sodium chloride or ionic compounds are in what we call a three-dimensional lattice. Okay, This three-dimensional lattice here um, is not of atoms any longer. These are now ions. Atoms become ions when they lose or gain Matter electrons. Matter can be found so in any of four atom, states. Here solid, is now liquid, chlorine gas, ion. or plasma. Solid can, can be changed to liquid by melting. Atom. Solids can 17 change directly to gas protons. in a process called the negative sublimation. Charge, that means there's an extra liquid electron. is changed to gas so by boiling. Electrons. Gas can Still condense to liquid. In this ion. Solids sodium can be formed atoms. directly from we gas go by sodium. crystallization. 11. Protons. A plasma is we'll a group with. of positive and ions electron. and unbound positive electrons. Charge, it means there's now an extra Plasmas proton can be produced by energizing gases to give up electrons, than, as in this one neon more proton sign than there are and fluorescent too. Right? We don't actually change the, the number of protons. The sun is also a plasma. Over 99% of the matter found in the universe is in the plasma state. So now state. we have 10, right? So we have an electron configuration of neon. All right, so we've seen this before. And now we're going to see what happens when you put this into water, how that is a chemical reaction when you dissolve solid into water. Still of sodium chloride is placed into water. The hydrogen ends of polar water molecules attract the negatively charged chloride ions and gradually surround them. 
Likewise, the oxygen ends of water molecules are attracted to and surround the positively charged sodium ions. The hydrated ions drift away into the solution, Sodium chloride crystals are held together by attractive to forces between the positively charged sodium and negatively charged chloride ion. The entire crystal dissociates into solution. All right. So, that's kind of a little Sodium you know, aha moment where we see how the ionic compound, the three-dimensional lattice, can dissolve into water. Things and we've seen that before. We put salt in water and we watch it dissolve, right? All right. So, um, we're going to skip that video for now. Let's see, should we? Yeah, let's skip it for now. All right. Brass is an element. True or false? Well, here's how we know. We go on the periodic table and we look. You can look back and forth and you're not going to find it. So the answer is it is false. Brass is not an element. And that's how you answer the questions about an element. And you'll always have your periodic table. Natural peanut butter is a, is is pure or a pure substance. Natural peanut butter made by just crushing peanuts. Peanuts are are living organisms, right? They're seeds of uh, plants. Um, they have DNA. They have proteins. They have salt. We've eaten them. They taste salty. They taste they have some sugar, they give you energy, right? There's plenty of different compounds in there. So there's no way that that's a pure substance. Pure substance would mean just one kind of compound. All right, so gasoline and water would make a heterogeneous mixture. Heterogeneous mixture, what does heterogeneous mixture mean to us? All right, let's make sure we have an understanding of heterogeneous mixture, a little review here, all right? So if I have a um, container here, and in this container, I'm going to put some water and some gasoline. I don't know if you guys know what would happen if you put water with gasoline into a container. Um, it turns out that water would end up at the bottom and the gasoline would end up at the top. And this is the same as with um, oil and water, right? Gasoline is very similar in its proper properties to oil. Uh, so water would be down Still, here. Sodium and chloride the, um, is placed into water. Gasoline the hydrogen ends there. of polar water and molecules attract the negatively charged chloride ions and gradually surround them. Likewise, the oxygen ends of water molecules are attracted to and surround the positively okay, charged sodium ions. All right, so um, the hydrated ions drift away into the solution. Gasoline allowing new water molecules to surround water, newly mix. exposed ions. And that's one of the reasons why, well, I mean... Gradually, the entire crystal dissociates a, into in solution. Car, say you're driving a car, and sometimes on a rainy day, if your car is old, it lets water into the gasoline tank a little bit, or maybe some moisture from a previous night that's cold, and then a, a, a day that uh, allows the water to, the, gas, the gaseous water to condense into a liquid. If you get water in your motor, then the car will stall and stop working. And when that happens, you, you pull over to the side, right? You pull over to the side, and you usually try to crank it through, or you go to the um, mechanic, and they'll try to push the water through mechanically by turning the motor with something else. And then after it gets through, then it'll, it'll work again. But you can imagine that if you're in a plane and that process has to occur, you can't just pull over, right? So planes uh, have a mechanism and that mechanism is is performed every time they fly, a mechanism for removing water from the gas tanks. And essentially in, in planes, and now I'm just gonna draw like a small plane here, but in a, in a small plane, we have the propeller up front. All right, let's see if I can draw this little plane a little bit. Whoops. Something like that. Okay, so if I have a small plane like this, uh, oops, I can get out a little bit so you can see a little better. Not a very good drawing, but it's all right. So here's my plane. The wings should be a little bit longer here. So um, the gas tanks are right here on top of the wings, and the bottom of the gas tank is, there's a low spot right at the bottom of the wing, underneath it. And every time before a plane takes off, you can watch it even if you're on a, um, a, an airliner. You can look outside and look under the wings, and somebody comes underneath there and um, will, I mean, will get a little vial, which opens up the bottom of the gas tank, and 
lets out anything that's at the very bottom of the gas tank. And you'll get a little bit of, uh, you'll get gasoline, and sometimes you'll get a tiny little bit of water, okay? So that's an example of uh, something that they do to take advantage of the fact that gasoline and water don't mix, and you can't have, any, because you can't have water in your gas tank when you're flying. All right, so would that be a heterogeneous mixture or a homogeneous mixture? It would be heterogeneous. Heterogeneous refers to the fact that if I just look at one spot, the concentration of water and gasoline differ. If I look at those different locations, if I look at this spot and look at its concentration, I can see that it's going to be different. Concentrations meaning the amount of water and gasoline at this spot and the water of gasoline at this spot or this spot, right? Or maybe right here where it's all gasoline, right? Does that make sense? So throughout the system, the concentrations will differ. Therefore, it's a heterogeneous mixture. All right. Extensive properties depend on the extent of stuff, right? If I have a lot of a material, if I have a big balloon, small balloon, those are extensive properties. Intensive properties are properties that depend on the kind of material it is, right? Um, I can look at this water here and I can tell what the temperature of the water is. How can I tell what the temperature of that water is? Because it's boiling and all water boils at 100 degrees Celsius. In fact, we can't cook things at above 100 degrees Celsius in water. And that's why you can't cook French fries in water, right? To cook French fries, to give you yourself a crisp potato on the outside, you need to cook it in something that, that can allow the temperature to increase above 100 degrees. If you put a potato in water, it gets mushy, and you know you can make mashed potatoes, but you don't get the same effect, uh, and that's that's why there's the significant difference between French fries and mashed potatoes. All right, so I see the water is boiling; it has to be 100 degrees Celsius. All right, that's the boiling point of water. All right, so now there are some general laws of chemistry that um, were gradually identified, which uh, make uh, chemistry or give chemistry the ability to do all the things that we can do with it. One of these laws is the law of conservation of mass. All right, so if I have a chemical reaction, A plus B plus C going to A, B plus C, B, maybe I need two Bs, right? So a chemical reaction like this, I can know that the mass of all of these added together is going to equal the mass of all of these. Mass does not change from left side the right side. Okay, that's one of the laws of chemistry, that the, the law of conservation of mass. All right, and it's really, a, 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 well, yeah, that's good enough. The law of definite proportions, all right. In general, if I have a chemical reaction that goes something like this, where A and B come together in this ratio to form this compound, let's say, all right, two A's come together with one B to form A2B, all right. If I have conditions where that will occur in some container, some temperature, some pressure, and then I repeat the reaction, but this time I'm going to add three A's and a B, what will happen? Well, the law of definite proportions says that if I'm using the same conditions, same pressure, same temperature, same container and everything, I'm not going to get anything different. I'm going to get the same thing, but I'm just going to have leftover A. All right. So the law of definite proportions means when you react two things together the same way, you're always going to get the same result. If you have excess of one of them, then you'll just end up with excess on the other side. That's the law of definite proportions. And here's a couple of examples of these using something that are a few different kind of silly examples. Uh, law of conservation of mass. You take bread, bananas, and peanut butter, and in the end, you're going to get the same amount of stuff that you start with. Right? If you make this all into to, to sandwiches, you get the same amount. Here's another example. We have a chemical reaction that's sealed in a container. We perform the chemical reaction, get a change, but the mass of the whole system is the same. All right. Here's another one. Nine grams of water can be split into one gram of hydrogen or eight grams of oxygen, or and eight grams of oxygen. Right? The sum of the product's mass is always going to equal the mass of the reactants. All right. Now. Some people might try to look at this a little bit deeper and say, wait a second. I thought the ratio of hydrogen to oxygen was 2 to 1. 
two atoms of hydrogen for every atom of oxygen. Yep, that's true. That's true. However, we know from, well, maybe we haven't really paid that close attention or recognize it, but the mass of hydrogen, there's only one um, proton in a hydrogen, but there's eight protons in an oxygen, right? And so that's why, that, well, that's not completely why, but the mass of an oxygen atom, which isn't eight, but it ends up being 16. Now we haven't talked about this mass number yet, but the point of this is that the mass of, an, of atoms is different from each other. So if I draw this taking nine molecules of water, let's say, and we break it up into its constituents, hydrogen and oxygen, right? I'm going to get 9 times 2, 18 atoms of hydrogen and 9 atoms of oxygen, right? So that is going to be the ratio that I get. But this isn't 9 grams of water. This is 9 of these water molecules, all right? So when we write a chemical reaction, we're not saying 9 grams. I've never, you know, <coughs> put any units on this. It's 9 of those molecules. In this little example here, though, we're talking about actual grams of stuff, OK? And you'll note that these numbers don't match up. If this were, I mean, if I were to add up these on the uh, right side here, you'd have 27 gram or whatever's of things. And here I only had 9, right? And that's OK. That's all right. It's like saying, OK, I have an apple here. Here's my apple. And inside I have, um, inside this apple, I have six seeds. Well, then I separate it out and get my six seeds and my, whoops, that's supposed to be a slice of an apple. All right. My slices of apples. And I might get seven slices of apples from that apple, right? And that's not anything wild or crazy. I had an apple and now I separated it up into six seeds and seven slices, okay? So it's the same thing. You can take nine water molecules and separate it into 18 hydrogen atoms and nine oxygen atoms. This isn't nine grams of this and 18 grams and nine grams of that, right? All right, but the law of conservation of mass says that the mass of the reactants will always equal the mass of the products. All right, so if I have a, a problem like this where I say I'm gonna burn some magnesium and oxygen to form magnesium oxide. So I'm combining what? Magnesium and oxygen. So I need to eventually, and this will come gradually, but need to be able to look at a phrase like this, um, a statement like this, and draw a chemical reaction that represents what's going on here. So here I have um, magnesium and oxygen gas coming together. All right, And I'm going to form magnesium oxide. MGO, MGO. Um, it says if 16.88 grams of magnesium, 16.88 grams of magnesium, all right, a little arrow there to remind myself, are consumed and 28 grams of magnesium oxide, so I get MGO, 28 grams, uh, what mass of oxygen was consumed? How much of this was there? All right. Well, law of conservation of maths, mass says that the mass of this plus the mass of that has to equal the mass of that over there. So my 28 minus 16.88 should tell me how much mass of oxygen I needed. OK? All right. So here's an example of the definite law of definite proportions, right? Uh, again, um, if I double the mass of water, right, I don't. I get double the mass of hydrogen and double the mass of oxygen, right? Um, I don't get um, three times the mass of oxygen and less hydrogen, right? And that makes sense, right? So these are the law of definite proportions. And that can work both ways. If I take a gram of hydrogen and combine it with eight grams of oxygen, I'm going to get nine grams of water. If I take two grams of hydrogen and eight grams of oxygen, this is a good question for you. If I have two grams of hydrogen and eight grams of oxygen, how many grams of water am I going to get? How many grams of water? I'll give you a second, push pause, and try to make sure you can answer that question. 
Okay, hopefully you push pause and you took a good stab at this question, try to figure it out. The answer to the question is, I'm going to get only nine grams of water again. Why am I only gonna get nine grams of water? Well, I had some more hydrogen, but I ran out of oxygen, right? I had eight grams of oxygen, and I know that eight grams of oxygen combines with one gram of hydrogen to form nine grams of water. It doesn't matter if I have more hydrogen. If I still only have eight grams of oxygen, I'm only gonna get nine grams of water, right? Because oxygen ran out. It was, the, it was limiting. It was limiting our reaction. So I'm gonna get nine grams of water and what else? One gram of hydrogen left over, correct? All right, so here's another example. Let's see if you can answer this one. Push pause, take a second, try to answer the question. All right, make sure you push pause and giving it your best shot. Now I'm gonna help you, okay? In a sample of magnesium oxide, there are 16.89 grams of magnesium and 11.11 grams of oxygen. So that means here's a sample of this stuff. Here's that sample of magnesium oxide right this is magnesium oxide in that sample of magnesium oxide it contained 16.89 grams of magnesium and 11.11 grams of oxygen and then it says what mass of oxygen would be, there be in a sample that contained two grams of oxygen or two grams of magnesium two grams of magnesium so I have another sample over here and this one seems to be a smaller sample right a uh, smaller amount of magnesium oxide. I know that because it says it only contains two grams of magnesium, right? Two grams of magnesium. So they're asking how much oxygen, X grams of oxygen, how many grams of oxygen would there be? Well, these are in the same ratio, right? Because this is the same material. It the law of definite proportions means that this ratio here has to equal that ratio there. And from your math classes, I hope you uh, know how to, under to solve this, right? 2 times 11.1 equals 16.89 times x. So 11.11 times 2 divided by 16, and that should be our answer. Okay? So 1.32 grams of oxygen is the answer there. All right, so... Charles Dalton came up with an idea about these atoms, right? And he, he was one of the first to kind of, well, he was the one of the first that people began to believe. There were this idea of atoms a long time ago, but he also had, he was one of the first to be able to kind of show experiments that were consistent with suggesting that atoms existed. Showing that elements could rearrange, but that we weren't ever creating or destroying elements all right um, now what proof do we have nowadays that atoms exist now again atoms are kind of like a model but they've sure gotten us a long way and um, it there's plenty of room to push in terms of understanding the atom as well um, we have the ability to look at surfaces with scanning tunneling microscopes and see little spheres like this and you know that's consistent with what our understanding would be of an atom, right? A spherical little thing. It's because there's an electron um, cloud around our nucleus, and this is the electron cloud that we can kind of, um, you know, we can't see this with our eyes, and we can't use really, I mean, when we use an electron microscope, all we're doing is we're throwing electrons at it and seeing how those electrons bounce off the surface, and then that indicates to us what the surface might look like. All right? Another thing we can do is make really small pieces of gold. And then this, this, this is what this solution is here, really tiny nanoparticles of gold. And here is a, a picture of those, whoops, of those nanoparticles up close, All right? And so we see little tiny spheres. Now these are not spheres of gold. I mean, they're not spheres of atoms of gold. They're spheres of little particulates of, of clumps of atoms, right? 40 nanometers. Uh, let's see, that means this is probably about uh, you know, 5 nanometers or 2 nanometers, but that's still much, much uh, larger than an atom would be, right? However, if you look at these ones close up, you can see on the atoms, oh, sorry, on the nanoparticles themselves, 
this three-dimensional lattice of elements and if you kind of um, were to draw a big huge if you were to draw a big huge um, sphere of spherical I mean a big huge chunk of spherical atoms you would see these lines as well all right so as far as everything we can see everything suggests that atoms uh, the model of the atom is consistent and helps us uh, understand material and how chemistry works the things around us work so there's also a law of multiple proportions just like there's a law of definite proportions there's a law of multiple proportions and essentially the law of multiple proportions says that if you change the conditions in which you interact your reactants then sometimes you'll get different products and just like a banana sandwich there can be uh, you know a double decker a single layer banana sandwich different kinds of ways to make it right and here's another example if I combine sulfur and oxygen under certain conditions I'll get a SO2 molecule if I combine them under different conditions I'll get an SO3 molecule all right so there are laws uh, there is a law of multiple proportions but again it, what it essentially says is you have to change the reaction conditions and that will provide different proportions all right so we have two substances that are formed from a and b it's a b and a 2 b 3 a 2 b 3 if the mass ratio of a to b is 3.49 what's the mass ratio of a to b in sorry if the mass ratio of a to b in a b is 3.49 what's the mass ratio of a to b in a 2 b 3 all right this is a mathematical problem it's kind of difficult you can take a stab at it if you want to let's see how well you do there's lots of lots of ways to kind of to solve this so if you want to take a second and, and solve it I'll let you do that now push pause all right otherwise let's finish it up here together um, so apparently a over B all right a over B that ratio we're told is 3.49 right 3.49 and in the second compound a 2 b 3 2 a over 3 b that ratio right there will be related to this ratio because these are the same masses of these atoms right so here I can solve for one of these variables I can say if I multiply both sides by B then a will equal 3.49 B right so now I have something that A equals to, and I can put that into this little spot right here. So 2 uh, times 3.49B over 3B will give me, okay, so uh, I'm going to take uh, 3.49 times 2. 6.98, so I have 6.98 B, 6, whoops, 6.98 B, um, and then that's over 3 B, so now I'm going to divide that by 3, so 2.32, so I have, the answer is 2.32 B. Oh, and B's cross out, sorry, so 2.32. So what that shows me is that this value here, this 2 times 3.49B over 3B, which is equal to this 2A over 3B, right? 2A over 3B. So what I see here is that 2A over 3B equals 2.32. Oh, is it 2.32? Oh, no, it rounds up to 2.33. All right, so that is how I solved that one. All right, so an introduction to how we're going to be using math in this class and that hopefully you have had the opportunity to um, uh, become a champion at that math. All right, so... Chemical equations, we've had a little bit of introduction to already, we've talked about. 
These are our reactants. These are our products. This little sign means reacts to produce, yields, uh, come together to form, right? So I could say two HCLs, one CaCO3, react together to form one CaCl2, one water, and one carbon dioxide. If they don't have a coefficient, it's one. If it has a coefficient, I say the coefficient, right? Oh, we also can see the states here. Aqueous, solid, aqueous, liquid, gas, right? Balanced equations have the same number of atoms on both sides, right? So um, we use coefficients to balance equations. Coefficients are the big numbers in front. We don't use, we don't change the small numbers, the small subscript numbers to balance equations. All right, so here's an example of a chemical reaction, C4H10O2, uh, right, and it's balanced, right? The coefficients in front make sure that the number of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen atoms on the left are the same as the carbon, hydrogen, oxygen atoms on the right. So let's see if you can balance this equation. Or no, let's see. Let's see if we can count the number of uh, Hyd or different atoms on both sides. All right, so take a second to try to count the number of iron, oxygen, hydrogen, and nitrogen on the left and on the right. All right, push pause if you need to, to do that. All right, so this is the number of, oh, I guess we were trying to see if that one was balanced or not. I guess it ended up not being balanced. All right, so here we go. Let's um, balance this equation. All right, so we got C8H18O2, CO2, and water. All right, C8H18 uh, plus O2 goes to CO2 and water. All right, so let me get a different pen here. For a second, if I can find it. All right, so C8H18 plus O2 goes to carbon dioxide and water. All right, very good. So now we're going to balance this equation. We balance by inspection. There's no tricky way to do it. You just kind of look. I can see really quickly. What was that noise? I can see really quickly that um, I need more carbons on the right than I have on the left. I have eight carbons here, so I'm going to put an H right in front there. And now my carbons are balanced. Now I can see also that I need more hydrogens on the right. It looks like I need nine hydrogens right there uh, because now I'll have 18 hydrogens. And oxygen, what do I need with oxygen? This is the last thing to balance. So let me count up how many oxygens do I have here? Eight times two, that's 16. 16 plus nine. All right, I got 25 oxygens. So I need to put a number in front of here to get 25. If I put 25, I'm going to have 50. So maybe I take 25 and divide it by 2. Hmm, that's 12.5. Well, I can do that temporarily. I can write 12.5. All right. Now, when I balance an equation, I shouldn't leave it with fractions like this 12.5. Right, but it's an okay kind of uh, way station to, to kind of say, okay, I see the ratio that has to exist. And now I can fix this 12.5 by multiplying everything by 2. So the balanced equation is going to be C8H18 plus 12.5 times 2 is 25 oxygen molecules, uh, 16 carbon dioxides, and 9 times 2, 18 water molecules will result. And now I'll see that all uh, that is our balanced equation okay good how about this one here can you balance this one here why don't you take a second and try to balance this equation here same way all right hopefully you tried and let's, let's see if you got it right okay let's see here did you get this all right this should be your answer um, you can go through it and we can double check. We can see that when I have this statement here and that one, looking at nitrogens, for example, first, I have a total of how many nitrogens? 
this means three, right? If I look over here to the right, how many nitrogens do I have? Just have one nitrogen, right? So I can start off by putting a three here, all right? And let me write this down piece by piece for us. NH4, three, PO4, space all right so there's my chemical reaction and I'm going to balance it I said I was gonna put a three here to start off with now I can see the answer is not three but that's all right I'm going to just put that and uh, work from there okay um, what's next I can look at the phosphor phosphorus here P Ooh, looks like I need two phosphoruses here so I'm gonna to have to put a, a, a two here and when I put a two there, because you can see there's one phosphorus on the uh, right side, and on the left side here, I have two phosphorus. So when I put a two there, and that's gonna need to make this a six, right? All right, so then I can look at barium. On the left, I have one barium. On the right, oh, I have three bariums. So I'm gonna need a three there. All right, looking on the left, I have a total of four carbon. Looking over here on the right, is that right? How many carbons do I have there on the left? Yeah, four carbons. And on the right here now, how many carbons do I have? Oh, no, 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 not four, because I have three of these things. So I have, this is four, but four times three is 12. Okay, let's follow that up here a little bit better. Uh, I have a three here. And so in, be in this, Parentheses here, I have two times two is four, but then I have three of these things. So four times three has 12 carbons on the left. And then over here on the left, I have two times six, that's 12 there. Okay, and let's see, I've done nitrogen, phosphorus, barium, anything else? Carbon, oh, hydrogens, I can do hydrogens here. How many hydrogens do I have? Well, this thing on the left has, uh, four times three, 12 times two, 24. 24 plus, so I'll write that down because I'm gonna forget. 24 plus three times two is six. Six times three is 18. All right, 24 plus 18. 56, 56 hydrogens. Wait a second. 24 plus 14, that's not 56, 24. Six times four is 24, six times three is 18. Six times seven, 42, 42. 42 hydrogens, is that right? Eight, nine, 10, it is, 42 hydrogens. On the right here, how many hydrogens do I have? Well, all the hydrogens are right here. Did I do that right? Oh, here we go, four plus three, seven, six times seven, 42 hydrogens. Okay, so my hydrogens balance. What else do I have left to balance? Um, oxygens, is that the last one? On the left here, this is eight oxygens. I'm balancing my oxygens here. Eight oxygens on this little segment right here. On the right here, four times three, 12 oxygens. So there's 20 oxygens there. Over here to the right, what do we got? Six times two. So there's 12 oxygens in this last one. And there's eight oxygens over here. All right, so oxygens are balanced too. All right, now there's another way that we could have uh, done this, another way that we could have kind of looked at this. And um, that way, another way that we could look at this is to look at the 
um, kind of the clusters of atoms, all right? So here we have NH4 in a parentheses like this. And here we have the NH4 right here. It's not in parentheses because there's not three of them. There's just one of them. Here we have the C2H3O2 in parentheses with a 2. Here we have the C2H3O2, no parentheses because there's just one of them again. Here we have the PO4, no parentheses. And here we have the PO4 with the two parentheses. The clusters often, not always, but often don't change from the left side of the equation to the right side of the equation. So if you look at this in terms of clusters, then that can simplify your life significantly. All right, Because essentially what we're doing here is we see that we have three of these NH4s and one of these NH4s. So that would tell us that we could put the three there, right? And we, over here we see we have two of these C2H3O2s and one of these C2H3O2s. So we can put, we'd have to double it and that would give us our six. And then we can also see that we have uh, two phosphates here. Um, we had the two there, or sorry, the PO4s, that's the phosphate. You don't know that yet. All right, so um, and that's another way to kind of simplify that. All right, so that brings us to the end of chapter one. Now you're going to have some practice problems and try to uh, solidify this stuff into your minds so that you can build upon it. A lot of this is review for some of you, but uh, you don't want to take it lightly. You want to um, try to learn every step along the way. All right, thank you.